On this Friday night from Quebec City, the papal visit draws to a close. The Pope's final brief stop in Iqaluit, where he's facing calls to bring a priest to justice. This monster cannot, cannot be allowed to get away for what he did. Plus, a desperate plea for murdered and missing Indigenous women. I feel like the Pope is not touching on it at all. Canada soccer accused of dropping the ball. Many girls quit playing sports because of this. Another blistering report into sports and sexual misconduct. Plus, Russia's astronomical ambition. It is 100% possible this is all just fluster. The Kremlin's plan to go it alone in space. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight from Quebec City, Jeff Semple. Pope Francis touching down in Iqaluit tonight for the final stop in his pilgrimage across Canada. The pontiff met with residential school survivors from Nunavut and attended a public event and celebration of Inuit culture. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We are coming to you again tonight from Quebec City where the Pope began this day. He apologized again while speaking to a small group of clergy, residential school survivors and representatives from First Nations in Eastern Canada. And tonight, while addressing the crowd in Iqaluit, he repeated that apology once again for the historic wrongs carried out by, in his words, more than a few Catholics. A short while ago, I listened to several of you who were students of residential schools. I thank you for having had the courage to tell your stories and to share your great suffering. I had not imagined the suffering. This renewed in me the indignation and the shame that I have felt for months. And you can see the crowd there, the Pope addressing, including residential school survivors from some of Nunavut's 13 residential schools. The last one didn't close until 1996, and it was an emotional evening. Hard to find a dry eye in that crowd. The Pope has made several apologies over the course of his tour here in Canada, but he is facing criticism for not explicitly apologizing for the institutional role of the church in the residential schools. Our Mike Armstrong has reaction from those who gathered to hear the pontiff's message here in Quebec City this morning. There was some frustration as Indigenous leaders and survivors left the meeting with the Pope. Some of the support workers escorting survivors were asked to leave before it started. The meeting room, as it turned out, was too small for everyone. A lot of the room was reserved for the bishops. Uh, I think, in my view, too many. It was exaggerated. Now, what came after that initial snag appears to have been a success. The Pope, in his speech, called this trip an intense pilgrimage, saying the stories he's heard will stay with him and that he returns home enriched. I thought it was good. Yeah, he was very humble, sincere. Yeah, I, I, I try to notice about him. Following the Pope's address, the survivors lined up and they addressed the Pope. He was very, uh, very receptive. Joan St. Denis says she went up twice because the first time she was flustered. But her meeting, she says, wasn't about anger. I had a good chuckle with him. You know, he's, uh, I didn't go into any, um, anything about uh, the schools, you know. Uh, I just told him where, where years that we went, but I didn't get into anything heavy. Some of the leaders today said the survivors who came represented many more and that there is no right or wrong way to react to this visit. Just as the pain was an individual experience, so is the healing. If what the Pope has shared hits home for them, that is their journey. If there are some survivors who do not, that's their journey. When Noella Robinson met the Pope, she gave him a bottle of maple syrup. She joked it was to sweeten him up. Robinson is today focusing, she says, on the positive. I am, and that's what it's about. To me, that's what it's about. I'm an older lady now, and I can't just keep going back and rehashing the past. So today is closure, and I will work towards uh, good things and uh, hopefulness for our people. Now, one thing we heard over and over today, and in fact all week, is that while there are people like Ms. Robinson, there are others who feel completely differently. The people who were here say they know that and that that opinion has to be respected 
people heal in different ways and on different timetables. Jeff? Mike Armstrong here in Quebec City. Thanks, Mike. The Canadian government has just issued an extradition request calling on France to send an oblate priest here to Canada. Johan Rivoire is accused of sexually abusing residential school students in Nunavut during the 1960s and 70s. And residential school survivors asked the Pope to intervene directly in that case when they met with him in a Iqaluit tonight. Jack Anawak has been waiting a lifetime for this week. The 71-year-old taking a boat trip near his home in Iqaluit with some of his children and grandchildren while reflecting on his own childhood. Anawak was just nine when he was taken from his home and forced to attend a residential school in Chesterfield Inlet. I was one of those that was abused sexually. Um, and I, it took about 30 years before acknowledgement of that fact. Anawak later became an MP, parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs, and an architect of Nunavut's first public government. But one of his proudest moments came in 1999 when he spoke out for the first time about sexual abuse by Catholic priests. There was quite a bit of opposition to it, but we persisted and persisted. And the more we pushed it, the more widely known it became. Three decades later, Anawak is now welcoming the Pope to his remote northern city. <laughs> the pontiff greeted by residential school survivors, performing drum dancing and throat singing, a celebration of the culture the church tried to destroy. We wanted to um, stage that although there was an attempt to take our language and our culture away, we have strived to thrive. At the ceremony, this survivor and her sister lit a colic oil lamp in memory of their mother, whom she remembers standing on the shore watching as her children were taken away by boat. She just stood there for the longest time, just staring away. And so I said, uh, when, when they started talking about residential school and how hard it was for themselves as children. I said it was very hard on our mothers as well, on our fathers. For the church's role in those atrocities, the Pope was expected to apologize in person. But these survivors say his actions moving forward will speak louder. They want one of their alleged abusers, a French priest named Johann Rivoire, to finally face justice. His actions were atrocious. Rivoire worked in many communities here in Nunavut during the 1960s and 1970s, before finally returning to France in the 90s. And a few years after that, the RCMP issued a warrant for his arrest. Rivoire was accused of sexually assaulting several children in Nunavut, but France refuses to extradite its citizens to face charges abroad. So the 93-year-old remains free reportedly living in a retirement home for oblate priests. This monster cannot, cannot be allowed to get away for what he did. This former student planned to raise Rivoire's case with the Pope directly during their private meeting. I'm sure he has a lot of influence uh, with the uh, French government. We're heavily um, um, uh, leaning on uh, Pope Francis to do something about uh, Rivoire to be brought back to Canada, period. The Pope's visit to Iqaluit was scheduled to last just three hours, but these survivors were determined to make every moment count. When the Pope comes here and apologizes in person, and hopefully from the heart, I think there will be a lot less skeptics uh, out there that these things really happened. There will be that healing process amongst not just us, but our children, other people who were impacted by the system. And so I think it will be a big step forward for, for a lot of us. The federal government is accused of failing to deliver on its pledge to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. And one advocate took those concerns on the road this week, hoping for an assist from the Holy Father. Nithu Garcha reports. Lorelai Williams, whose indigenous name is Pelehalsia, packed carefully for her trip from BC to Alberta for the start of the historic tour that's now in its final leg. I feel like the Pope is not touching on it at all. 
For more than a decade, she's been advocating for missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Having lost her own aunt, Belinda Williams, and her cousin, Tanya Holick, whose DNA was found on the farm of serial killer Robert Picton, she knows firsthand the systemic neglect that fails them. We get certain tips. We go in the community. We're putting ourselves in dangerous situations, and I'm just like, why are the police doing this? You know, it's, it's so frustrating. She's fighting for the families of multiple women around Vancouver whose cases are currently open. I'm desperately searching for Tatiana Harrison. It's been more than a year since Ottawa released its national action plan following the 2019 inquiry that concluded violence against this demographic amounts to a genocide. In a news conference last month, advocates said little has been done. This is a national shame and it is also dangerous. Williams paid her own way to Edmonton, and she did the same going to Rome this past spring when an Indigenous delegation met with the Pope at the Vatican. The genocide happened to our people, and it's still happening to our people. It would be really nice to have him acknowledge the genocide that has happened here. Dina Jules is a survivor of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Before she left for Edmonton to see the Pope's apology in person, the community elder said his acknowledgments and actions are critical in creating societal change. We get a lot of hate mail and uh, people that deny uh, that these atrocities happened. If he acknowledges it, if he supports us, some changes will be made. And until then, she says she'll remain a visible and outspoken symbol for her stolen sisters. Nitu Garcha, Global News. And a reminder that if you or someone you know is a residential school survivor and looking for help, you can call the Residential School Survivors and Family Crisis Line at 1-800-721-0066. Turning to other news now, and a damning report that criticizes Canada soccer for mishandling sexual misconduct complaints against a women's soccer coach. Now you'll remember that Hockey Canada's funding was frozen last month following similar allegations. But for now, the sports minister's office will only say it is still analyzing the report on soccer's governing body. Abigail Beeman has the details. I don't think I understood that damage. That um, being silenced as we were for so many years, the toll it took. Kira McCormick sounded the alarm years ago about her former soccer coach, Bob Berarda. Now she's sickened to read the report detailing how Canada soccer mishandled complaints, but hopeful it brings change. It was just such a perfect storm in terms of like all these players with these big dreams and like, you know, everything, it meant everything to play for the national team. And then that was literally what was weaponized against us. The report found a continuing pattern of harassing emails, sexting, flirting, and other inappropriate behavior from a coach with significant power described as godlike. Berarda was allowed to resign in 2008. The report focused on a statement about a mutual decision to part ways without mentioning harassment, calling it a gross mischaracterization of the circumstances and failed the victims of the harassment, their teammates, and the organization as a whole. With no oversight, the organization did not follow the procedures of their own harassment policy. The failure to terminate Berarda and impose disciplinary sanctions afforded him the opportunity to continue coaching, putting other players at potential risk. Canada Soccer did not respond to an interview request, saying in a statement it accepts the findings and recommendations and unequivocally apologizes for letting participants down. These types of abuses and bullying are, are widespread. Uh, many girls quit playing sports because of this before they have an opportunity to really see what their potential is. Many are hopeful the spotlight on Hockey Canada will help spur similar traction here. I want to see um, the same accountability. Soccer Canada, Hockey Canada and other national sports organizations need to be held to account, but also the Ministry of Sports and Sport Canada needs to be held to account. Berarda currently awaits sentencing. He pleaded guilty to three counts of sexual assault and one of touching a young person for a sexual purpose. His lawyer did not want to comment on this new review given the ongoing court action. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that condom use can affect consent in sexual assault cases. 
The ruling is based on a BC case in which a woman told a new sexual partner that she would only have sex with him if he wore a condom. He did the first time, but not the second. The Supreme Court has ordered a new trial for that case, saying sex with a condom is a fundamentally different act than sex without one. And you are looking now at Iqaluit, the final moments of the Pope's trip here in Canada, a farewell ceremony on the tarmac before he flies back to Rome. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Quebec City. Dozens of prisoners of war have been killed in a missile strike in Ukraine that both Kyiv and Moscow are blaming on each other. Ukraine says Russia targeted the prison to hide the mistreatment of those being detained there. The Ukrainian foreign minister calling it a war crime. But the Kremlin says Ukraine is trying to frame Russian forces for the attack. Ukraine, meanwhile, says the first grain shipments are set to resume from its port cities one week after a deal was struck to allow their export through the Black Sea. In a rare trip outside of Kyiv since the Russian invasion, the Ukrainian president visited a port today, saying he's awaiting the signal for the first shipment. And at least 16 people, including children, have been killed in flash flooding in Kentucky. The state's governor expects the number of dead could double because the water isn't expected to crest in some areas until Saturday. Entire communities are underwater, some homes even floating away. Emergency crews have already had to make hundreds of rescues. Spacing out, still ahead, Russia's plan to fly solo in space. While well, Russia's war in Ukraine drags on, the Kremlin is also making moves in space. Moscow wants to leave the International Space Station and build its own. As Resmond Shannon reports, the move spells the end of a decades-long partnership between Russia and the West. International cooperation in space goes back long before the end of the Cold War. We're building up drugs. In 1975, the Soviet Soyuz and American Apollo crews docked in space and met. And lift off. Then for the past lift two off. decades, the International Space Station became a permanent home to humanity from Russia and the West. It's hard to overstate how much they've truly trusted and relied on each other. This project, the way it was designed in the 90s, um, it was uh, designed to be interdependent because of the technological uh, architecture. Over the years, seven Canadian astronauts have visited. Chris Hadfield even commanded it. When Russia first invaded Ukraine, cosmonauts and astronauts vowed to stay united. But since then, Russian crew members have made patriotic gestures. Despite tensions, Moscow and Washington just signed a new deal to continue flying to the station. But this week, Russia's new space agency boss says he wants out, possibly as soon as 2024. NASA says Moscow later clarified that it will only leave once it finishes building its own dedicated Russian space station. We can be pretty sure that that will take at least five years. Sanctions and war only make that even more difficult for an increasingly isolated Russia. In any case, even the Americans want to mothball the aging ISS in the coming decade too. It is 100% possible this is all just fluster and they have every intention of continuing their efforts with the National Space Station. And Moscow is unlikely to find a new partner in China either, both for technological and political reasons. The biggest benefit for the National Space Station was that it was a diplomatic tool. I don't know what will replace it. If and when Russia does leave, our utopian ideal of international cooperation could float off into space. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Up next, reflecting on the Pope's pilgrimage of penance as his Canadian tour comes to a close. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Quebec City. As the Pope's visit to Canada comes to a close, residential school survivors and their families are reflecting on an historic week and the path forward. The road to reconciliation that saw the Pope journey from Alberta to Quebec to Nunavut in many ways began in Kamloops, British Columbia. 
the discovery of more than 200 potential unmarked graves near a former residential school last year that led to more discoveries across the country and more shocking headlines. But those stories were old news to many residential school survivors who'd been demanding a pontiff apology for years. And then all of a sudden, boom, started, things started, finally. Things really started happening. The papal visit to Canada is the first in two decades. The Pope came to apologize in person. I kind of felt very emotional about that. He said the right words that we want to hear. But for many, the Pope's apology fell short. He blamed individual members, but not the church itself. Nor did he commit to reparations, or disclosing records, or returning indigenous artifacts, or revoking the 15th century doctrine of discovery. Some are left asking where reconciliation goes from here. Some people say it's not enough, I agree, but I think we have to start. In a walk, you have to do the first step, even if it's not perfect. For many, this week was an important step on the path to reconciliation and education. Canadians have been forced to face a painful past that survivors hope will shape their future. We have a flag that represents the children who never returned home, she says. It's a heavy burden to carry, but for many years we could never speak of it. Today, we can speak freely. And that is Global National from Quebec City on this Friday night. I'm Jeff Sumpel. A celebration of Inuit culture in Iqaluit in the final moments of the Pope's visit to Canada. He's now heading back to the Vatican, marking the end of a powerful and polarizing visit to this country. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.